was a tech reporter, and I was at Newsweek when basically it went under <clears throat> and, um, in 2012, and I got laid off, and I was 52 years old. And I looked around, and it wasn't just that my company was going out of business. My business was going out of business. And I always wanted to work at a, a tech company. I always had this idea of working at a startup. They always seemed to be having so much more fun than we were, you know, the journalists. You know, you'd go visit these guys, and it looked like they're having a blast, right? Because they're all growing. The companies are making money. They're, they're, they're hiring rather than laying off. I had spent the last 10, 20 years in companies where you're always waiting for the next layoff. So I went to work at a place called HubSpot, which makes marketing software. Um, and it was like, had every startup cliche. They're in Boston, so I didn't have to move. They had every startup cliche you can imagine. So we had the dogs in the office. We had nap rooms. We had beanbag chairs, which at age 52, you should not have conference rooms with beanbag chairs, because you can get into the beanbag chair, but you can't get back out. Like, there's no graceful way to get out of a beanbag chair, you know? So you'd see all these people kind of crawling around on all fours after a meeting, which I thought was very undignified. Um, they had. The average age was 26, literally half my age, right? And almost everybody was right out of college. They had these like bros who would like, they had a push-up club in the lobby at lunchtime, like doing their, their bro thing, like do you even lift? And, um, <clears throat> and I have to say, I very quickly realized it was like a blend, it was like a mix of a frat house, a Montessori kindergarten, and a Scientology compound, right? It was like, <laughs> like all three things in once, right? And <laughs> thank you. So um, equal parts of each. They had a culture code. They, they loved culture. They wanted to talk about culture. We're going to make culture overt and explicit, and we're going to create a company that we love, right? Um, and the culture code basically just defined how, what does it mean to be HubSpotty? How do you belong to the cult, right? Like, how do you fit in? And they had a, a couple acronyms, HART and VORP. VORP was value over replacement player, which is like, comes from baseball, pro baseball. Like, why are we paying you more than what we could pay the average person to do your job? which is a, a cruel metric. And the other one, in my case, I thought they should have a negative BORP because they were paying me a pretty good salary and I did almost nothing, right? So, um, and heart was, you had to be humble, effective, adaptable, remarkable, and transparent, right? And at, the, at, the, at one point I had to have a, a review with my boss, who was a guy not my, in, in, my for, in the 40s, say, but two grown men and we had to sit in this little tiny room and he had to give me a heart score and I got a two. And I kind of thought like, how has it happened that two grown men are sitting in a room having a discussion about such obvious risible bullshit, right? Like, like to say, you know, like heart, what's your heart score? Like, and how, and, but it sounded all scientific. Here's your number. We can, we're a data-driven organization. Your heart is a two. I'm like, why? why, why it should be a zero, right? I, mean, I have no heart, right? Um, they had training when you joined, and they would talk about your superpower. Like, what's your superpower? And they would talk about this literally, and I would burst out laughing. I was a journalist, right? Like, I mean, you know, journalists really don't like this stuff. So, what's your superpower? What is your superpower? And we went around, they had two weeks of training. We had to learn how to use the product, but it was really indoctrination, right? And they would tell these kids, do you know how lucky you are to be here? Thousands of people wanted the job that you got. But it's harder to get a job here than to get into Harvard, right? Which is totally not true. But anyway, but... Um, uh, <laughs> And so they would feed them all this stuff. And then they would be like, okay, what's your superpower? And then we had to go around and tell something about ourselves that no one knew that made us special and made us a snowflake, you know? And um, I'm like, I don't really, you know, have anything, you know? And like one guy was, I play in a heavy metal band on weekends. I like, go, oh, cool, you know? I was like, well, I don't, I'm the only one in this room who's had a colonoscopy, right? <laughs> and they, and they're like, they, they take a hose. You kids, you won't believe this, but trust me, this is coming for you, right? They take a hose, but they do give you, they give you pills. You don't remember it, you know, but you know they did it, right? You know? Um, and they're just looking at me like, dude, what is wrong with you? Like, no, like nobody laughs, right? Like, nobody, you know, nobody laughs, right? That was my superpower. I endured the colonoscopy, right? I'm the only one here who takes Lipitor. I have high cholesterol, so, you know. Um, so, um, and then the main way to succeed was just to be enthusiastic. You didn't have to do anything. You just had to be a team player, like a total team player. You had to be GSD, get shit done. And this is a real chalkboard, HubSpot equals cool. Like somebody at work just stopped on their way to get coffee and just wrote HubSpot equals cool on a chalkboard. Like I don't know why, right? Um, they had a slogan, one plus one equals three, right? Which you guys all did math. You know that's not true, right? But I mean, so one plus one equals three. And then they would say things like, I like that idea, but I don't think it's one plus one equals three enough. You know, we're HubSpot. We have to do something a little better. I'm like, I, what? So... Uh, <laughs> And they had cheers for peers. So constantly people would be cheering for each other because the way to get attention or to, get, to move up in the organization was to show that you gave praise to other people. It took me a long time to figure this out. So we would get these praise-gasms, I call them. They were like emails with, um, someone would say like, oh my God, I just want to say that Ashley last week totally crushed it when she was running a blog all by herself, right? <laughs> but it would be to everyone, right? Everyone in the whole department would get this email. And then the protocol was to reply to all. 
you had to reply to all saying, oh God, girl, you go, you know, like, woohoo, ask me for president. And like, and if you didn't reply to all, like you looked like a curmudgeon, right? And then you, so your email would fill up with like a hundred emails from people all saying the same shit to each other, right? And for a while I would ignore it. Then I thought like, I'm looking like a grumpy old guy. So I joined in and would be like, woohoo. And I put like 800 exclamation points, you know? And then someone figured out like, dude, you're being a dick, stop that, right? So like, uh, <laughs> So I'm thinking, like, this place is nuts, right? This place is really crazy. And then one day, the founder there published a, an article on LinkedIn. He had a new management breakthrough, which is that he really wants to always be solving for the customer. And so he would bring a teddy bear to all of his management meetings, and they would have to talk to the teddy bear as if it were a customer. That was a way to remind you to always solve for the customer, right? So I'm like, okay, this is officially nuts, right? Like I spent, I spent all these years writing about Apple from the outside, envisioning it as this cult compound, and now I'm living in a real cult compound, right? This is even crazier than I ever imagined Apple, even as a fiction writer, right? So I, I sat desk to desk with this guy who was like my boss, who was like 12, and I was like, and I was like dude, hey, dude, that thing with the teddy bear, that's crazy, right? And he's like, well, no. And I'm like, look, I was like, look, no one else is around. You can tell me. Like, we know. It's nuts, right? And he's like, no, I think it's, you know, it's kind of eccentric, but it's good. I was like, oh, my God, right? So, I, I, like, no one will laugh at the teddy bear. That was even worse to me than the teddy bear was the fact that no one would laugh at it, right? So I called, I called a friend of mine who had left journalism and become a marketing guy but had done it successfully, unlike me. And... Uh, and I said to him, I told him about the teddy bear, I showed him the article, I was like, is this normal? Like, man, is this what it's like in the corporate world? I didn't know, you know? And he's like, no, dude, this is Jonestown. Like, get out now. Like, run now. Like, you're, you're sort of one step from having to be, drink Kool-Aid. Like, literally, they're going to go around, you're going to do the mass suicide, the white robes, the whole thing, right? So, um, and this is what, meanwhile, everybody else, look, this is a real picture. And this is how they were every day. It was like, it was like being in La La Land. It was like, people, like living in a musical. Uh, this, everybody was really, really happy, right? And I was not, and I, which makes you miserable. It makes, it's crazy making, because you're like, maybe something's wrong with me, because they are all really, really happy. Maybe the world has changed, and now people bring teddy bears to work, and that's cool, and that's normal, right? Um, but as time went on, I realized, that, oh, I went going the wrong way. Um, in fact, it wasn't. People weren't happy. When they did studies and they did surveys, they, they did relentless happiness surveys. They had very high turnover and very low morale. And that puzzled me, too. But then I realized there were two cultures. There was a surface culture, which is all that crap. Then there was a real culture, right? And the real culture was that they had this huge sales boiler room, this telemarketing boiler room, where they put me in for a while to punish me for asking for a new job. It was like really, really loud. And I had to listen to this guy named Noisy Pete all day long, get on the phone and say the same script over and over. Hey, Bob, how's it going down in Orlando? How's the weather down there? Yeah, great. Hey, what's your marketing plan for this year? And they click, hang up, start again, right? Smile and dial all day. So these kids would get paid very little money, stuck in a room, given a really hard number to hit that they couldn't hit, they would get burned out, and then they'd get churned out. And then the rest of the company was the same way, only it was even less rational, because you could get fired for no reason at all. And this, they'd have a little group of people, and one would be made the boss, and she would just fire all the people she didn't like, right? Because they had these untrained managers, these undertrained managers. Nobody got any training at all. So it was just like Lord of the Flies, right? You just take a bunch of kids and put them in a room and let them be crazy with each other, right? Um, one of my favorite stories was, oh, when, and when they fired you, they called it graduation. This is great. This is a great thing. And we get these cheery emails saying, hey, everybody, just want you to know that Derek has graduated. We can't wait to see where he's going with his next big superpower rock star adventure. It's like, dude, you fired that guy, right? And you'd look over and be like, wait a minute, Derek's gone? Like, and then you'd look and his desk is empty. Everything's, those like spinal tap drummers, just poof, they go up in a pile of snow, right? Like people, and it would happen all the time. People would get fired all the time. It was like living in Argentina in the 1970s. Just boom, they just disappear, right? So. Um, and then I realized they don't even think this is a problem. They think this is great. The high turnover thing was actually like they would say, you know, they would explain it by saying, well, you know, we're, we're, we're rock stars and we can only play with other rock stars. So, you know, if you weren't a rock star, you got graduated, right? And this wasn't even unique to them. It came from Netflix. This is from the culture code, but this came from Netflix. We're a team, not a family, right? This idea that, you know, we, uh, we need to have a players in every position, but it's telemarketing, right? It's customer support. It's not, you know, anyway, it's more like, it's just a way to use a vendetta on people, right? The other thing I started looking around and realizing is they had this huge emphasis on culture fit, which I think has become this terrible euphemism, this really bad euphemism, which really means racism and, and lack of diversity. And it's a way of sort of turning a negative into a positive. So I look around, there's no one over 30, like hardly, except for me and one other guy who wanted to become my friend and we used to go for lunch together and they had to break up because people would see us paired up like the two old guys, right? We had to have a man break up. So, uh, but 
there went, and there were no people of color, like no black people. We went, the first time we had a whole company meeting, I looked, it was 700 people in a room, and it's like all just white kids in their 20s, and like not even a very diverse group of white people. Like Klan rallies have a wider swath of the Caucasian population than we had. We had like one kind of white person. It looked like the kids you see on Cape Cod in the summer. Like Cape Cod just barfed up the whole population, <laughs> launched them into Cambridge, and they all landed in one building, right? Um, so, I started realizing there were really serious problems about this. Like the, the, the industry, in a way, had gone wrong in ways I, wasn't, I, I didn't understand. Reed Hoffman at LinkedIn actually brags about this. So don't think of your job as a career. You're not coming here to work for a long time. You're not going to do what Linus Torvalds does and write an OS for 25 years. No, you're going you're to work here for a year and a half, and then we're going to graduate you, and you're going to go do something else, right? Um, at Amazon, this. So I left to write this book, and they hacked my computers and tried to find out what I was writing, and then the FBI got involved. There's a great, great other story that's in the end of the book. But uh, Amazon, you know, you walk out of a conference, and grown people are sitting there crying at their desks, right? And I start thinking, like, I've stumbled into a much bigger story than I realized. And people start writing me. People read my book and start writing me, telling me these horror stories of things like what I experienced at HubSpot wasn't really all that unusual. In fact, it's becoming the norm, right? Um, Jeffrey Pfeffer, who's a, a professor at Stanford, wrote an essay when my book came out, Why Modern Work Culture Makes People So Miserable, right? Um, Saying it's, it's a return to the a work arrangements of 140 years ago, not some a new managerial innovation. It's worth, if you're in the gig economy, God forbid you lose your job and now you have to become an Uber driver because they won't even pay you as an employee, right? They may force you to be a contractor. And VCs won't invest in your company if it's a gig economy company if you want to make your employees actual employees, right? Which kind of kills me because Uber has apparently $10 billion in cash sitting in the bank that VCs have given it, but they won't pay their, their drivers as employees. They won't give them benefits, right? Um, when, the, when the drivers sued, Uber spent $100 million to settle the suit to make it go away, which tells you how badly they don't want to make people employees.